Powered from the Sereno Cigar Company studio in North Carolina. Welcome to Primetime Special Edition number three. Tonight we have Gabriel Alvarez of Casa Cuevas Cigars as our special guest. We're also going to have a special segment surrounding cigar hype and a lot more on this edition of Special Edition. Special Edition number three is sponsored by Drew Estate. Check out and download the Drew Diplomat app for your mobile device. Keep up with everything going on Drew Estate. Experience the subculture that is the rebirth of cigars. Available on iTunes or Google Play. For more information, check out www.drewdiplomat.com. And we are on the air. Welcome to special edition number three. Will Cooper from the Sereno Cigar Company Studios in North Carolina. Joined tonight uh, across the country from uh, Texas, my co-host, Bear the Pussy. Bear, welcome. How you doing, Coop? Hey, so we had a little bit. We had. It seemed like everyone had a tech. Last week was my technical issues, um, and this week I think it was yours and, and, and our guest Gabriel, who we'll introduce momentarily. It, it, so it always happens. So appreciate the audience hanging in there a little bit. Uh, it's it's always one thing or another. For sure, absolutely. Yeah, it's all right yeah. though. No, so uh, yeah, so I mean, um, just uh, you know, how was your week going this week so far? Oh, uh, it's going pretty good. It's going pretty good. Uh, did uh, just a regular nine to five and everything like that, uh, but getting ready to do some of my shifts at Michael's Tobacco and uh, uh, and uh, they're actually having a little uh, cut and light with uh, one of your guests a couple weeks ago, Fred Rui and Nomad Cigars. He's over there right now, so uh, they're having some good times without me, but I'm having some good times right here and getting ready to get started and uh, get to chatting with Gabe here about uh, Casa Cuevas. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, for folks who are, uh, you know, been following the primetime show, primetime special edition, it's our spinoff, so to speak. But it really is uh, an in industry content, industry people, just like we do on the primetime show. And we were able to mix it up here and change the format around from time to time. And it really allows us to bring in guests. And, and I'll tell you, Bear, we've been real blessed um, in terms of people. Who, hey, we've been reaching out to people to come on the show. We've actually been overbooking, which is which has been a, a good problem to have. Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah, and you know the, the IPCB our trade show is coming up, and uh, you know we we want to you know for folks who, whether the folks are going to the trade show or not, you know we definitely want to give them as much exposure as possible. There's a lot of good announcements coming, uh, uh, so this is why we have special edition. And um, yeah, so I think it's been great. So tonight, actually, the first person to be a guest on special edition is uh, my friend. I've known this guy for several years now. Uh, one of the great guys in the cigar industry, Gabriel Alvarez. Gabriel, Will and Bear here. How you doing? Doing well. Doing well. Thank you for having me on. It's 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 a uh, no. It's uh, we're really really uh, pleased to have it. Um, you know, and it's uh, you know, I've been following you for. I think we know each other. I I remember we met in Chattanooga. I think we met in yep. Chattanooga. At the tweet up. At the tweet up. Yeah, and it seemed I think that was 2013. So it's about four years right now. Yep. yep. Um, Gabriel, so you're, we're going to get into Casa Cuevas Cigars, but um, what is your role? What are you actually doing now for Casa Cuevas Cigars? For Casa Cuevas, I am the director of sales slash everything else. <laughs> <laughs> we're a, we're a two-man show at the moment, a uh, small company. Basically, it's a startup thanks to the FDA. Um, we launched the cigars prior to the deadline last year or Lewis launched the cigars part of the deadline. I came on board um, after I resigned from my previous company. And it's been a fun, fun ride from the beginning. So, Gabriel, yeah, I mean, you've, you've had you're, – you're a very experienced guy in what you're, you're going to be doing. Um, in terms of how you got that, you actually started out on the retail segment. Is that correct? Correct. I had my own store here in Miami. Uh, a lot of people knew it as the neighborhood humidor. Uh, yep, I think, yep, I've been there. Uh, it's under new ownership now. It's called Master Cigars, and the uh, funny thing is that we did the Casa Cuevas launch party at Master Cigars, so it kind of came full circle for me. I didn't uh, realize cool. that was the same place. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it's owned by Felipe Sosa. Uh, he's known. He was uh, the master blender for Torano Cigars for a long time, and, yeah. and he launched the Master Series through Torano, and uh, he helped blend also La Rosa de San Diego. And now he's got his own shop here in Miami. Have you have you smoked La Rosa de San Diego? Yeah, man, I actually have good cigar. 
they, they are really good cigars. Bear, I don't know if you've smoked in La Rosa de San Diego at all. No, I haven't. I uh, haven't had the pleasure yet. I've heard. Uh, I've actually heard a lot about it. So when he said that, my ears kind of perked up a little bit. I, uh, I would definitely like to get my hands on one of those. I, I'm not sure if they make their their way this far out west or not. But uh, if they do, I should try to get my hands on one for sure. Yeah, they. I know they're pretty prevalent in the Miami area, and I'll be heading to Miami in, in November. So I, I know. I know there's a place. I know. Well, obviously, I know a place now. I know a couple places where I could definitely get my hands on them. And they were coming out of American Caribbean, um, those cigars, I believe. That was their brand. Yeah. So, yeah, Gabriel, so from, from the retail end, you you went over to – first you went to Coots, correct? Correct. I was and, the operations manager at Coots, helped launch them, learned a lot. And um, from there, I went to Maya Selva, learned a lot more there. Yep. And then now I'm here at Casa Cuevas. Still learning. Um, I think you know. I think in this business, we're, we're always learning here. Uh, and you know, tell us, tell us a little. So you you went. You know, obviously, when you left my silver, I believe it was last October. Uh, last September. Last September. Okay. So you know, obviously, you know, I, I was I was glad that you stayed in the business. But what kind of attracted you to go to Casa Cuevas? To be honest, um, the family history with the Casa Cuevas family, it's, it's incredible. They, their roots go back to Cuba. There are four generations in the tobacco industry. They used to grow, and they were purveyors of tobacco in Cuba. They didn't have brands or anything like that. They used to grow their tobacco and sell it. And um, in the 50s, everybody knows what happened, and they took off into the Santo Domingo and the Cuevas family stayed in Santo Domingo growing cigars or making cigars and it's a uh, it's a really rich history in the cigar industry from all aspects of it nowadays they don't grow their own tobacco uh, they purchase their tobacco just about from everybody and from all over and I've had uh, the ability to go to the or the honor to go to the factory a couple of times now we've been there oof, probably about four times since I started with them, and every time I go there, I fall more and more in love with it. And just the aspect that they have just about any type of tobacco available to them, and if it's not, they go out and look for it, wherever it is, if they want to try it for something, they, they have it there. It's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Um, and Casa Cuevas came up because of the FDA. They've been dabbling, the family's been dabbling to launch their own line for a while, and it was never the right time or the right fit, and, and Lewis, the owner, says he also never had somebody like me to launch the brand, because he, at the Tabacadera Las Lavas, which is the factory in the DR, they've been a private label company for a very long time, and they make cigars, or they've made cigars for a ton of people, Sam Lucia, Tarano, um, Gurkha, CI. right? They did some for Gurkha. Too. Gurkha. We make all the cellar reserves for Gurkha at the factory, except for the platinum that's made in American Caribbean and Nicaragua. And a couple of other lines for Gurkha are made at the factory as well. And basically, uh, they didn't have the need to come out with their own line. They were doing very, very well with the private label. But since the FDA came in and they said, if anybody comes out with a line after August 8th, they have to go through the whole approval process that nobody knows what it's like still. Uh, they decided to make that launch. You know, that's uh, it's a really fantastic story. And the, the Cuevas family does have a, a very incredible and deep and long long history, as you, as you definitely alluded to there, Gabe. Um, you know, I'm interested to see what uh, what your thoughts are on if there are any differences at all or if you've just kind of approached it the same way in terms of the difference between uh, switching from a you know Honduran uh, base facility to uh, to a Dominican one uh, what are your thoughts on that Factory, factories are factories they make cigars cigars I mean premium cigars it's tobacco over tobacco bunched up or rolled up or intubado. they're all made in the same fashion they're handmade products, whether it's made in the DR, whether it's made in Honduras, whether it's made in Nicaragua. 
it's the same exact process. I mean, do people have their own tricks in the trade? Of course. They all do. And some people use Lieberman, some people don't use Lieberman machines. And some people just go strictly 100% hand bunched or hand rolled 100%. But it's a handmade product. We all smoke them. And the differences aren't, aren't there. I've been to factories in Nicaragua. I've been to factories in Honduras. I've been to factories in the DR now. And it's the same exact process. Fantastic. Good day. Now, you, you notated uh, the different types of tobacco that you guys are working with. Now, the, the three core blends that you've already released uh, have a lot of the same principles involved. Uh, you know, there's uh, the Ecuadorian Habano, um, and the uh, Nicaraguan in the binder is kind of uh, a uniform kind of platform, if you will, that's on all three cigars. Uh, but you've got Dominican, you've got Honduran and stuff. But uh, um, I noticed uh, doing a little, re a little bit of research that you guys are, are dabbling with or at least you've you've dealt with and with all the cigars that they've made for everybody else over time they've dealt with Peruvian they've dealt with Colombian like in the the Maduro that you guys make right. um, they've dealt with uh, I'm really excited about Indonesian and Peruvian tobacco I'm a, I'm a big I'm a big you know seldom used leaf nerd I love Indonesian tobacco uh, I, I mean when we met when you came up to Michael's tobacco that one time and you handed me my first uh, um, my first Miro that I had when you were with Coots, and I was like, <laughs> uh, you're like, oh, this is Sumatra, and I was like, oh, that's the one I want to start with. There we go. And I mean, immediately in love with that. But uh, I mean, are you excited about any anything on the horizon as far as working with some of those seldom used leaves or the seldom used tobaccos uh, as opposed to what you've got rolling? I know you want to get these growing and you want to yeah. build a foundation, but I wanted to see if you were excited about any of those specific tobaccos. We are, honestly, and, and um, we were just at the factory about a week ago, and we're working on reviving an old family blend that the family had for a while, and it fits the predicate profile, and it's gonna, it's, it's, we're in the process of getting all that taken care of. And um, one thing that I fell in love with there at the factory, and, and like I said before, we have access to a lot of different types of tobacco, and in the DR, there's a lot of suppliers being that the big boys are all there. And the Colombian, like you said, was a tobacco that I had never tried before. And it's something that we're using in our Maduro line of Casa Cuevas. And it was just something that added to that blend incredibly. Um, you can't really use an overabundance of it, but just a note of it in there made a difference on the blend and that's why we threw it into the Maduro. And it's funny because you try all these cigars or all this tobacco individually and you're like, holy, you know, it's, it's, it's a powerhouse or this. And it's going to do this to the blend. And then when you start putting them together, it does something different than what you, you thought in your head would would do to that blend. And, and you like it or you hate it or you're like, eh, you know, we could use it or I'm not happy or it's not what I was looking for. So it, it gets to be a lot of fun, a lot of fun there when you're playing with all these different tobaccos. And, and last week we were playing with, with certain tobaccos. And like I said, we tried it individually and, and one of them just threw me to the floor. Uh, we got some, some Connecticut broadleaf in the factory and we were using it for something else. And I had never tried Connecticut broadleaf on its own. And when I smoked that just with an Avano binder on it, it just put me on my, on my ass basically. I had to take a break, almost like 20, 30 minutes, go get some orange juice or, or Coca-Cola <laughs> and, and, and just take a break. and, and Cleanse Lewis the palate, kept, huh? Yeah, and, and Lewis kept giving me cigar smoke. I'm like, oh, give me a minute. You know, I, I, need, I need to. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, really. I took, a, <laughs> I took like a really big hit of that Connecticut because the flavors were so intense that I really wanted to get into it. I retrohaled and everything, and, and even the guy that's sitting behind the table, he was like, holy shit, you know? He, he took a big hit on that, and we're not FCC regulated, I can say. No, we're not FCC regulated. All right, perfect. Yeah. Um, and it was it – was, it was First thing I asked, by the way, when I started doing this. Dude, so. we had a Ron Jeremy <laughs> conversation on the last show. So the, uh, Whoa. Yeah, so I can tell you where that went. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it's okay. We're not going there today. No, no. <laughs> but, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, especially experiencing all these new tobaccos. I've been more on the sales side of things and, and not really into the blending. I've, I've been able to give my opinion and I've been able to visit the factories and my other two companies that I was with 
and and put some insight into it. But in Kutz, I was a rookie in this, and I was still dabbling and getting to know different tobaccos, and I knew what I liked, and and I was getting to know what I didn't like. And Maya Selva, very set in their ways, very classic company, and they already had all their blends established. Um, so every now and then I would get something from the factories that they were trying out for something else or or the blender there he was like hey try this i, I just made this and i was like I, I got to try panamanian tobacco and, and i fell in love with that and um and here it's it's with casa cuevas it's just that that ability to be able to get new things and and, and play with certain things and it's unfortunate the way the industry is going with the fda that we can't come out with 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 more things it's it's it truly is i'm, I'm saddened by it because yeah we can get creative i mean there's so much to do still with all the tobacco that's out there. Gabriel, I, I totally agree. You know, I've had a chance now to smoke through the whole line. I'm actually smoking the 60 of the Habano. I see that. These are not cookie cutter blends you no. guys have put out. You know, I can no. see a lot of times, and I'm not trying to knock any companies, they'll put out a Connecticut, a Habano, and a Maduro. And I can pretty much go in and guess what it, what a lot of it's going to taste like. These really surprise me. I mean, they're like the, these, these cigars have just brought... Uh, a real refreshing kind of change of pace because you mentioned the Colombian tobacco and, and that Maduro, which you know, I only know one other Maduro that I've had that has Colum that that's used Colombian that I could think of. And this Habano is just, I mean, this Habano is is I've been chain smoking these Habanos, uh, so they they are just they are just great. That Connecticut as well. I mean, so I think that you're definitely bringing a product to the market that is it's refreshing i mean for the consumers and that's a shame that that could all go away with yeah. the way that the, the the industry and the regulations heading and it's like it's, it's like Luis Cueva says um if we're going to come out with a line to compete in this market we have to offer something different and when i came on board within my first two or three weeks that i was with the company we flew to the factory and, and he goes sit here we're going to smoke through all the blends. I want you to try them. I want you to be happy with them because at the end of the day, you have to sell these. And if you're not happy with something you're selling, it's it's now a job. And and I couldn't agree more with him. And his dad told me the same thing. He goes, I, you have to like what you're selling. And and I took it truly to heart. And the opportunity they gave me of having input and, and, and being able to go back and forth with them and saying, okay, how about this? Or can we tone it down a little bit on this? Or can we ramp it up with this? And they were for it. They, 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 green light, full speed ahead. Just walk out to the floor, tell the blender, hey, adjust this, adjust this, adjust this. And I'll tell you what, when I came on board, we had some really good cigars. And after I was able to, to sit with Lewis and, and discovering that Lewis and I had really similar palettes, we were able to go just back and forth on paper, not even trying the tobaccos and saying okay yeah you have a point here let's tone it down here let's add a little bit more of this and not really changing the blends in any way but we were tweaking to come out with something that's going to be different on the shelves um it took us honestly about a month to come up with the pricing where it could be reachable for anybody to try the cigar and not be offended by the price of the cigars um we're not making millions of dollars with this brand it's 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 a brand where the price points are high sixes to mid eights three sizes three different blends and, and we tried to keep it as simple as possible but the blends were as creative as possible as well and as non-offensive as possible as well. it was really our goal we wanted anybody to be able to pick up any of our cigars and say okay yeah this is a good smoke i can come back to this and and try it again and try it again and with the more time this cigars sit on the shelves or they age at the factory they're just getting better and better and better you know coop and i were actually talking about it as uh before the show started up because i i, I smoked through most of the line too i was going to smoke the maduro on 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 uh on air tonight uh, i'm uh, actually finishing off uh one of the connecticut's right now okay. but uh, we were talking about the habano specifically i didn't uh, i specifically i did some research obviously um you know, obviously on the brand, the family and things like that, but I didn't want to look at the blend because uh, I wanted to actually kind of just smoke it blind with no, uh, you know, prerequisite, you know, kind of assumptions or anything like that. And uh, uh, 
Coop and I were almost kind of in uh, agreement here. And, and Coop, if I misunderstood you, you can disagree with me here. But uh, when I smoked for about the first third of that Habano, uh, I was like, this is this got to be her Corojo leaf. I mean, that pepper is just so prominent and so beautiful, especially on the retro. And I was like, this has to be a Corojo leaf. And then when I looked at it and saw that, that it I was totally wrong. I was like, wow. Uh, and just, I, I, again, it kind of goes back to what you were saying about blending. Um, but I, my question, I guess, to you is, and uh, uh, what, out of the three lines, I mean, what, which one do you like the most? There you go. Okay. Maduro. Fantastic. I'm looking forward I, to it. I keep going to the cigar day after day and just, I find more uh, nuances to it and, and fall in love with it more and more each day as I smoke them to the point that we were at the factory, like I said, last week and, and we rolled, uh, we had some Lanceros and some petite Lanceros rolled for us. Oh yeah. There you go. And it's, Oh my God, those cigars are good. Good. I put a post last week or on the weekend saying it's a shame that we can't release these things because it's a great cigar to launch as like a store exclusive or or something like that you know or, or something that's available only through a certain group because the cigar is so damn good and it stays true to the blend it's it's delicious man the the one thing also i noticed about these three cigars is they're for i mean i this i think you mentioned already they seem like they're they're meant for any every consumer yeah. So really, you don't have to, you know, for Connecticut, you know, you don't have to be someone who just likes a mild cigar to enjoy that. And, the, and with the Maduro, you don't have to be someone who likes a full cigar to enjoy that. Right. They, they kind of seem to be in that medium to medium plus of the Habano and the Maduro. Connecticut a little more dialed back, I thought. But but I, I kind of felt you guys hit a sweet spot with that. Yeah, that, that Connecticut, if you notice, I mean, the blend for the Habano and the Maduro are almost the same. The only difference is that Colombian in there and, and it's – and there's there's Colombian in the in the Abano as well, but just not enough to mention it. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and it was just easier for us to keep the blends in that sense. But the the Connecticut, when we were playing with the blends, we ramped up that Connecticut, and I smoked it, and I was like, "Holy moly, this 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 is just past Connecticut. What what everybody goes to a Connecticut for, which is a nice mild cigar." mild to medium at best and 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 people just want that classic mild smoke that they could smoke at right. any time they're, they're on the golf course they're in the morning with their coffee um they they want to smoke a cigar at night after dinner and they, they're just looking for something with good flavor behind it and and that's what we did with the connecticut um just a couple of tweaks to the original blend and and, and ratios of the tobaccos that are being used in there and i i'll tell you what i start most of my days with that Connecticut and my coffee. Yep. Yeah, and but at the same time, I get. I think the, what I was trying, I was trying to say is, and you, you kind of just validated it. Is you know, hey, that Connecticut. It's if you if you're someone who enjoys something a little more fuller, you could get a lot out of that Connecticut. It's, it's, yeah, it's got, it's got cool body. Flavor. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's got that, body to it. It's got body. I'm enjoying. Yeah. I'm enjoying the hell out of it right now. So yeah. it's fantastic. Yep. Yeah, it's got some body to it. I mean, I've smoked it after a steak dinner, and, and I still get a lot from that cigar. Yeah. And it's just because I didn't want something more into that fuller category. Um, I still wanted to smoke a cigar. I just wanted to relax. And that Connecticut did it, you know. And, and, and it's like I said, it's, it's, we're not recreating or reinventing the wheel here. But we are trying to put something out into the market that's different, you know. And, and, and honestly, you've smoked the whole line, Coop. That Avano, that Maduro, tell me what else on the market tastes like that. No, no, no. And I'll even put the Connecticut in there as well. I mean, it's got its – but, yeah, that Habano – both those cigars were very, very – like I said, I had a preconceived notion because I've seen a lot of these trifectas come out. And I had – I had you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, these other cigars on the market are bad. It's just I could kind no. of – it's kind of like watching Groundhog Day. But here I <laughs> spoke these things, and I'm like – these things are, these things all brought something different to the table, and I think it's something very exciting that you're going to have as you now go to market with these things. It, it, this is exciting here. Yeah, I mean we've been we've been launched already for two months, 
and that's a that's another story we were supposed to launch last november we had some issues with um some trademark things and stuff like that and we had to change the fonts in our bands and our boxes and everything so that delayed us in launching the line and it pushed us from november of last year december that we we're going to launch the line into april of this year and it, it happened i mean and i th and i think honestly it was a blessing in disguise because the bands they pop the boxes pop the new font that we're using on everything it's just it's very legible you see the cigar you'll recognize it if you've smoked it before if you're looking for it from our advertising you'll find it right away in the humidors it's 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 very nice and it's it's a very classic look on the bands everybody compliments the bands and the boxes yeah, yeah i like the uh i like the fact that uh that the name is uh, uh cuevas is, is prominent you know uh you know the word casa is you know gets thrown around in this industry quite a bit it's it's on names it's on brands it's everywhere it's something that you've seen and everything like that and and you know you know obviously that's an important part to the company name and everything but the, the soul behind casa cuevas is obviously the four generations right. of tobacconists and I, I love i actually i was it's funny you brought this uh, this line of dialogue up because i was actually going to comments on that that I really like that you're, you're putting the name out there and and, uh, and really and I've uh, we talked about this in the first edition of special edition you know it, it took it took Frank Yaniza 90 years to finally put his name on a cigar and so when you've got a great family tradition of blending or a great tradition of tobacco uh, tobacco men and women and you put the name on it you know it's something right. phenomenal and you know it's something special right. No, for sure, for sure, and, and we're very proud of it. We're proud of the three blends. They're doing extremely well. I mean, two months we've been on the market, and we're in 28 accounts now. We opened up another account today. Um, it's just, uh, it's growing very nicely, very controllable, and uh, we're advertising. We're doing our thing. We're doing our thing little by little. Are you guys going in-house, or do you guys have brokers? Well, in-house, it's me, and I have a, a broker network that I'm putting together little by little. Uh, we're up to four brokers right now. Uh, I'm talking about fifth one in Texas, and um, these guys are out there and girl. So we have a we have a lady on board as one of our brokers. Um, we have Westgate out west. Yep. Uh, Frank Bellavia is controlling California, Arizona, Oregon, Washington. That territory over there, he might be picking up New Mexico soon, um, because of everything that's going on in California. And uh, here in Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale up, we have uh, Matt, uh, they call him Goose. Uh, he came from a retailer a couple of years ago, and he's developed his own broker business, and he's, he's doing some good things here in Florida. We, uh, we signed him up a couple of weeks back. And in um, Mideast, uh, Maryland, D.C., Virginia, we have Lisa Sigler. And what I'm looking for with the brokers is is energetic young they're out there hustling um, they don't have a huge portfolio but they have a decent portfolio at least one big brand that gets them into the stores on a regular basis um, and and these people that I've signed up so far and, and and are working with us now they fit those categories they fit you know what I was looking for And I mean, you mentioned the 28 stores. It it seems like you're targeting very key markets right now. You know, obviously well, it's it's, yeah. it's where we have our reps. I mean, uh, yeah. I live in South Florida. I know most of the shops down here. Mm -hmm. They've been they've received us with open doors, uh, thankfully, and I'm very very appreciative of it. And in the markets where the reps have signed up, uh, and they're 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 doing their thing. We have a uh, we have a store in Iowa that I opened up on my own and it, this gentleman um, I don't know if you guys have heard of uh, Club Earth I have mm -hmm. I have to you know he's he's somebody that's been trying to open up a store for years now and Chris has done a hell of a job to open up a beautiful beautiful store um, he's in Iowa he's got golf simulators in there humidors cabinets a huge lounge it's, it's a beautiful shop and I met him 
at the same tweet up where we met Coop originally and and back from back then he was you know trying to find the right location he had one on contract that fell through and and he finally got things up and running and he, we never lost touch and he just called me he goes hey you're with Cuevas I want Cuevas in my store and it's been working like that just on relationships that we built through that I built throughout the years that that Lewis has built throughout the years um and, and it's been working great and and these are people with the 28 accounts that we have I want to say more than 50% of them are already on reorders. Some of them are already on their third or fourth order. And it's been it's been going great. It's it's been a very controllable growth for us. And and we're very proud of everything the way it's going right now. And, and, and it's I always exciting. Say, I always say Gabriel, it's that reorder. That's really yeah. going to determine if you penetrated that account. Exactly. Exactly. You can always get into a store for the first time and and introduce the cigar and and, and the way I've always done business is I don't I don't overpromise, but I also don't like to get into a store where I'm, I don't have a way of, of supporting them. You know what I mean? And and that says a lot for the companies. You know, everybody wants to sell, 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 sell. Yeah, hundred percent. But the retailer, at the end of the day, you can you can walk into a cigar shop and they're either selling cigars or they have cigars for sale. And the stores that I like to target. Are the ones that are selling those cigars that they have a staff or, or the owners very involved into his selection and, and knows his customer base and knows right off the bat if he smokes a cigar it, and, and it just pops into it as one of his customers oh this guy's gonna love this you know that's somebody that's selling cigars and that's the kind of store that i want to get into preach it gabe pete preach it man every retailer should be like that yeah i'm glad i'm glad you're seeking out those uh, those types of retailers because yeah that's something, I mean, I go in, I still go into shops, you know, being a retailer myself, I go into shops all the time. And that's probably one of the most frustrating things about this industry. And particularly with all the frustrations, like with the FD and everything like that, it's the, the lackadaisical approach and it's the shops that, you know, don't really have that relationship with their customers. And they're just, they're just, they're pushing a product. You could put any kind of widget there and they would put in the same effort. It's, it's not even about the tobacco. It's not about the relationships. It's not about the people. They're just selling because it's a job, uh, like you yeah, said. Or, or it's a hobby, or they're retired, and this is what they want to do instead of being home. I mean, and, and more power to them. I mean, I understand. it's a, But at the end of the day, it's a business. And a store needs a new cigar like it needs a hole in the head. And, and, I, and I'm quoting Eric Espinosa on that. Because when I opened my, my store, he was one of the first people to walk in through the door. And he's like, you know, stores need cigars, like they, new cigars, like they need a hole in their head. And it's true, you know. You have a customer base. They're used to smoking their things. You keep that humidor stocked and those things that those customers like. Every now and then, they're going to ask, hey, you have anything new? And as the retailer, if you don't push them to whatever is new, we can only do so much as the manufacturers. But if the staff or the owner of the store doesn't go in there and hand, you know, select a cigar and give it to their customer, that cigar is going to sit on the shelf. So it doesn't do anything for me to sell it to you once if it's just going to sit there and then oh it's my fault because I didn't advertise or I didn't do this or I didn't do that or I didn't do an event yeah but what about all the time that I'm not here you know who else is going to push it for me it's 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 a double edged sword and, and there's a story with this brand so it's not like hey I'm uh, there's someone who's come in hey I had a Maduro a Connecticut a Mono Me there's a there's a real story and there's a track yeah. record with mm -hmm. this company I mean, they, yeah, I mean, so the cigars that are coming out of, of that factory, I mean, the Cellar Reserve is Gurkha's top line. Yeah. It's, it, you know, the Tarano is you did Sam, it was, I believe they did Sam's white cigar down there. So, I mean. Black. The black. Oh, it was the black. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Yeah. It was the black. They did the black then. I forgot about it. The white came out of Nicaragua. Yeah. Yeah, we did the black out of that factory. And it that was, was a fire cured one. Yeah, that was the fire was that their yeah. first. Was that their first dabble in the fire cured tobacco game? Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's that's, the first time the factory had used it. That's that's phenomenal. That that just goes to show you right there. That's that's awesome. Yeah. And that was a that was a you know, back in two thousand thirteen that kind of you know, that's when the whole fire cured surge started and, and yeah. Sam was like that was the first one to hit the market. Yeah, it was then K, uh, the KFC and then the American Puro after that. The next yep. two big ones. Yep. No, exactly. It, exactly. So I mean there, there's a so 
I think it's important that, you know, obviously that you want to have the your, an educated sales force and educated retailers um, to do that. So I think you're, that's right on target with that. Thank you. Well, Gabe, not to not to go backwards or anything, but there was there was something that I kind of wanted to ask you um, in particular. Like, okay, so you, you you've in the last few years you've done some some amazing things. You know, you've gone from the retail side, and and like you said, you learned a lot with Coots, and and you 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 really brought that company up, and then you make this move uh, over to Maya Silva, and you did some great things of getting that into the U.S. market, and then you make this this uh, this this most recent move. I you know, I part of me is curious. I mean, I mean, with your track record for success and what you've been able to do with some of these small boutique brands, I mean, some of these, some of these bigger guys got to be, got to be knocking down your door. What's what's kept you, uh, uh, with with wanting to stay to stay small and 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 push the push these boutique markets so much? The the family approach to things. I'm a big family guy, as you guys see on my social medias. Um, I'm all about family, and one thing that really hit me when I talked to Lewis. Um, and don't get me wrong, I, I knew I was going to leave Maya Selva. And a mutual friend of Lewis's and, and mine put us in touch. Um, when I was already looking for something new, I didn't make it public knowledge because um, out of respect for the company I worked for, obviously. But... Jack Taranio put Lewis and I in touch, and Jack's a great friend of both of ours. Um, and when I sat down with Lewis the first time, and he'll tell the story, it's, it's hilarious. As much as he was interviewing me, I was interviewing him. Because I was about to have a baby, or my wife was about to have a baby. And if I was going to make a jump somewhere, I wanted to be sure that I can give that family time that I needed to, especially with a newborn in the house. And this job takes a lot of traveling. So I had a couple of options to become a territory rep or to keep going down the path I am in upper management in a, in a cigar company. Although I did great things with other companies, I'm still a newbie in this industry, believe it or not. It's, it's I've been now... I started my store in 2011, we're in 17. November will make it six years that I've been in this industry. Considerably, I'm, I'm still a newbie to be up in this upper management level. And, and I'm very honored that that Lewis felt the confidence in me to bring me on board to do this and to take this task and build this company. But the one thing that truly gravitated me to, 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 full, to push this through and, and to, to launch Casa Cuevas is that as much as I am a family man, Lewis is probably more of a family man than me. This man cuts trips in half because his kid's running a track event. Um, or his daughter was running a track event or had a soccer game or something. And when I saw that, or, or canceled the meeting that we had because he had to go to this event, when I saw that, I knew that this was the person I wanted to work with. So that was what... Made, it helped me make my decision. It, it just it, it finalized me making my decision. Was having the ability to be there for my kids because this man does it the same way, and he wasn't going to have me do any less than what he does. It, it, him and I work, you know, par. Him as the owner of the company, making sure that things are available for me to do, uh, to launch the brand and to get it into the people's stores and 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 gung ho go. He does things, he'll cut a trip from the DR to be back with his family, or he'll push a trip. He canceled twice. He had to cancel trips to the DR because his kids had events. And I have a lot of respect for that because in this industry, when you're in a bigger company and stuff like that, it becomes corporate. You don't longer have that that personal relationship with your boss anymore. It's it's you gotta deliver. And it's understandable. It's 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 corporate. We're talking huge numbers. With the bigger companies, and if the if the rep or the, the the territory manager or whatever it is isn't out there hustling, because he's got a family event, stores suffer, events suffer, things like that happen. So, by being able to be able to give my family the time that they need, and he does the same thing, 
it's it's what made my decision for me. You know, as the older but not wiser of the three here, you know, my kids are older. I know both Gabriel, you have two small girls. Bear, you have a small son. I'm going to give you guys the advice. Uh, yes, listen to what Gabriel just Follow that advice, Gabriel and Bear, because, you know, uh, this is a very good time. Uh, and if you have an opportunity to be in a position, a job like that, I did not have that. I came from the corporate area. I didn't have that. Um, certainly do that. That is, that is a no-brainer. That was that was the main reason I had opened my store was because I was on the corporate side of things. And when I got laid off because of the real estate crash and everything else, construction took a dump here in South Florida. Um, I had the opportunity to open up a store with my ex-partner. And I looked at it was well, I'm going to suffer for about a year or two financially. And but I'll be there. You know, I can be there. I had a one-year-old baby at that time. And to me, that was more important. I, I don't. Bl I totally don't blame you. I want, I want to kind of ask a follow-up to what Bear just So there's another unique part of your trail here in that you've actually, in each of your three management roles, you've been tasked with basically introducing a brand into the American market. So, I mean, pretty much from the ground up, like Coots, mm -hmm. even though you were a little more on the operations end of things, too. Then you had the same thing with Maya Silva. And now, obviously, you're doing Cats Equipment. And I think with your previous two jobs, you left those companies in much better shape than, than when they started. I mean, you think you could actually... Thank you, Coop. I, I, I think a lot... I don't think that's debatable, Coop, at all. No, not think, at all. I don't think from... it's debatable at all, either. I mean, you put those those brands on the map. And, and what's happened after that, I'm not going to comment, but... um. You know, that's something that is, did you ever think though, maybe, hey, why don't I go look at it? You know, did you ever think maybe, hey, instead of starting something from the ground up again, go into an established boutique, right? You know, it's kind of like, we were, I was, I guess I was talking to someone about Kevin Durant in basketball and they were criticizing him for going to the Golden State Warriors, right? Instead of going and right. taking on a rebuilding project with another team. But hey, you know, there's an attraction about going to the best team. I mean... Have, have you, did that ever kind of, did you ever get the bug, maybe, hey, I want to go and take something that's established and go to the next level? Or is this kind of where yeah. you feel your niche is right now, building brands? It, it, I've honestly fallen into these opportunities, honestly. And they've come at the right times in my life for me to make that decision to jump to them. But although the cigar industry looks huge, it's a very, very, very tiny industry. And... If I'm looking for something and there's nothing else available out there at the time because all the positions are filled, there's nowhere for me to go. Honestly, it's not like I can start just calling everybody, hey, you have something, you have something, you could do it, but all these positions are taken unless you know that there's a vacancy or there's going to be a vacancy or somebody approaches you and say, listen, I want to do this or I want to make a change in my company. That's the way this works. I mean, if anything in the cigar industry, you guys have seen, it's, it's recycled people. Nobody really leaves this industry. No. Yeah. You know, it's it, it, they'll go, look, shit, Jack Taranio. With the Taranio family, when they sold to General, they didn't have a place for him at the time. He went to work with Roberto Duran. He did great things with Roberto Duran. But then all of a sudden, General was in need of a brand ambassador. Jack just happened to be at the right place at the right time, or, or, or he pursued it at the right time. And it fell into place for him. Uh, family history in the tobacco industry for me to say, hey, you got a hole for me? I'm just another guy in this industry. You know, and, 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 and retailers, and you look at retailers, you see it. The employees, like you could have a rock star employee take off. He's going to be a rock star employee at another store. It happens. And in the in the manufacturing side, it's the same thing. Sales reps, they'll leave one company, they'll go to another. Management in the big corporate, they hire from within. They'll make a sales rep a, a district manager, and then from there he became a sales manager or something like that. Or somebody that jumps from another company. It just happens that when I was looking to go somewhere, there weren't that many places to go or places that I wanted to work at.
that make, yeah, and that totally makes sense too. I mean, like I said, it's kind of, it, it's also in a way kind of unique how that timing all worked out as well. A hundred percent. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree. And, you know, I, I've seen some of the things you, like, I kind of seen you learn along the way. I mean, I looked at when you were at Maya Silva, and part of really bringing a cigar in, into the U.S. market, you needed, you recognize right off the bat, hey, I need to have a Toro. I need to have a Toro size because you know, that's the size, it's a U.S. size, and, and you, you, had the, you had the insight to kind of go ahead and put that size into the market. Then, then it was a box press, the same thing, right. so... I mean, I've seen you kind of grow and, and look at this, look at things from a market and say, how can I better sell sell my product? Yeah, you, you got to you gotta look at what the market needs and, and whoever it is that you're working for, if it's a if it's an industry like ours, what does the market need? And, and, and you got to look at your portfolio. You got to analyze it. You got to say, okay, these are my top sellers. Sometimes you got to decrease your size and portfolio because things aren't selling and it's just a waste of money for the company to make a size that... 10% of the market is carrying, you know, or there's certain sizes that sell incredibly well in certain parts of this country and, and, and there's certain sizes that don't. But if a company in our market or in our industry doesn't have your three key sizes, Robusto, Toro, and Gordo, which is your six by 60, you're missing something. You got to give it to them because those are the best selling sizes in this country. You go, you go different regions, yeah, they'll sell a Lancero here and there, or they'll sell a Torpedo here and there, they'll sell a Corona or a Double Corona or even a Churchill. But your three main sizes are Robusto, Toro, and Gordo, nationwide. Oh, and that's what you went to, that's what you're going to market with, with, uh, with the Casa Cuevas and each of the three buns. Exactly. Yeah, he's a, he's 100% exactly. right about that too, about sizes being specific. Cause I mean, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a fairly educated uh, retailer at Michael's Tobacco and we have actually a, a really well learned customer base. We have a customer base that really does like the Lancero, that really does like the Corona. We sell a lot of those sizes of cigars, but we, we understand that that is a it is a rarity in this business. You you know, mm -hmm. Gabe just absolutely hit it on the head. You have to have a Toro. That's that's my general manager's favorite size. He'll smoke a Toro in any blend. That's his go-to. He doesn't reach for a Robusto. He doesn't reach for a sixty. He doesn't reach for anything else. He reaches for a Toro. He is the epitome of the American smoker today because that is the size for it. Um, but kind of to go along that line, Gabe, in in terms of of expanding. Now you kind of talked about the the Lancero and. Uh, Petit Lancero that you guys have worked on and everything. Do you do you envision uh, Cuevas uh, being able to do that kind of kind of be a little sneaky about that with the, their particular sizes with these blends? You know, get established, build that foundation with your core, and then hopefully introduce uh, you know a size that's you know could be a better cigar to uh, to some of these retailers. Well, if the if the FDA has their way, then no. There's we got to go through yeah, that whole process point. of approval. Um, we are releasing a fourth size uh, before the end of the year, uh, probably soon after the IPCPR. And that's going to be what we call the Clásico Prensado. It's a size that Lewis had imported as well um, prior to that FDA date, the August 8th date, and it's a 6x48 box press cigar. And it's going to be in all three blends. That's gonna be it. That's gonna be really yeah. unique. I'm Six really by forty-eight box yeah. press. Yeah, in, in these three. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's gonna be really good with the Habano for sure. Yep. I'm, I'm excited to try it in the Maduro. I, I, I mean, I've smoked it already, and it's a hell of a cigar. Um, and that's why we played with the Lanceros and the Petit Lanceros. But that's a personal thing. Those are the sizes that we love. You know. Right. And we did those for our own personal consumption, and and that's it. And uh, but that six by forty eight is exciting because it gives us another another size that we can release, um, and and it's and it's gonna fit another market that box press market. You got a lot of guys that are just smoke a box press cigar, and, and they'll gravitate towards it. Yeah, and it's kind of like it's a it's a short. I kind of think that's in like a short Churchill range. I mean, well, yeah, which I think is becoming it's become that's actually becoming a favorite size of mine. That. That six by forty eight, six and a half by forty eight. So I've seen a lot of companies do that, and it's it, for me. I I really I like a Churchill, but sometimes it runs out of gas, 
in that last inch and a half, and, and I find when it's a little shorter, it really, it, you know, I get that whole, I get that nice 48 ring gauge off that, which I like. Right. With those longer slender smokes too, you got a real nice, you get a real nice cool smoke about it too. I'm mm -hmm. a, I'm a big fan of the Churchill as well. Uh, it just doesn't, you don't see it very often, uh, particularly with a lot of boutiques and, and other companies. Uh, but I like that cool smoke that comes off the, off that longer slender smoke uh, at first. And then, you know, the cigar just naturally heats up because of, you know, physics and everything. Combustion and everything else. And, and you get more out of it too. I, I agree. I agree. Now you mentioned uh, IPCPR. Now I don't know if I heard this correct. Are you guys not going to be at the IPCPR this year? We will be there physically. Okay. We don't have a booth though. Okay. We're so not. I'll see, uh, I'll see you in Vegas, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll be in Vegas. Okay. We'll be in Vegas. We get there Monday night and we leave on Thursday. Um. That's because but, you guys are a manufacturer. You could be correct. there, right? So that's you going to be there in that type of capacity, so to speak. Yeah, we're going to be there as a manufacturer, and, and we have some meetings that we're going to do outside of it, outside of the show and stuff like that with, with uh, our brokers are setting up. So we have to talk to some people. Um, but look, we we decided as a small company just starting out, IPCPR is a huge expense, a huge expense. If we're going to do it right. We're going to do it right, and we're talking about upwards of fifty grand. Sure. To be there correctly, um, we don't want to get lost in that ten by ten booth or ten by twenty booth, or we don't want to be stuck next to a bathroom somewhere by the food court. You know, it's 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 something Lewis and I talked about extensively. For, we asked people what they thought, and we asked retailers what they thought, and other manufacturers what they thought, and and they're like, "Oh, you gotta be there," and I'm like, "Yeah, we'll be there," but. Do we do a booth? And, and Lewis is the type to say, well, if I'm going to be there, I'm going to be it. I'm not going to half-ass it or anything like that. I, I want to have a booth. And, and if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. And we sat down and started doing numbers, and we talked to a booth manufacturer and, and everything else. And when all said and done, in between union fees and everything else and transport fees and the booth fee and everything that came to be for that, we're talking about 50 Gs easily. Sure. So what we decided to do is we bring up that money and visit nationwide the retailers and actually have some time face to face with these guys, with their consumers and and introduce the cigar in that fashion. Well, that kind of takes on my next question, though, since you guys aren't going to have an official presence with a booth or anything at IPCPR, um, I guess let me shift my question to a timetable of 30 days post IPCPR. You're at 25 plus counts right now. Realistically, where do you want to be or where do you see yourself 30 days after uh, after the show? The show isn't going to be a factor for us in that sense. I mean, we might get a couple of accounts out of it from meetings that we have set up. Um, but honestly, if we're in about 40 accounts by that time, it would be great. You know, my goal is within the year to be at 100 accounts. That's sustainable growth. That's controllable growth. Um, that's inventory control. That's no back order issues. All those things. And and for a small company to go into the issues of back orders, things like that, and and leave the shelf space empty, you as a retailer know better that you know when a customer falls in love with a cigar, they want it there. And if they don't get it, what's the, what are they going to do? They're going to go to something else. They're going right. to go back to smoke before, and then. It's a crapshoot whether that cigar, when it lands again, if it's going to be successful again. Absolutely. Yeah, 100%. We don't want to have those issues. So that's why I'm trying to control the growth to be as controllable as possible. I, I would, yeah, I applaud that move as well. Because I've seen, I've seen some companies grow too fast. Or I've seen some companies where they are so dependent on the face of the company um, that when that face of the company can't be everywhere anymore, yeah, the brand so and I've seen brands suffer for that. Yeah, which and I and I want my reps out there doing events. I want my reps to do tastings and stuff like that. But we want to be there as well. Yeah, and and Lewis and I are two, and it's going to get to the point where he's going to go one way and I'm going to go another to work one territory or to do an event somewhere. And, and at the moment, we're going to be traveling together most of the time, and, and they'll get both of us there. They'll get the brand owner 
and, and the director of sales there to answer any questions that they have regarding the brand and, and to really get to know what Casa Cuevas is. Well, that's going to be a huge benefit for you guys in the long run to have that kind of representation. I mean, not only does it give, uh, um, you know, not does it not only does it put a a really nice uh, face for the company and everything, but uh, it'll also it'll also really ring true with a lot of customers. Like, hey, they they really care about this brand, and yeah. you know, they they brought in the whole uh, they brought in the whole pack to to get yeah. it uh, to get it going and everything. So that's fantastic. And, and, and. And we care about them, you know, we care about the consumers, we care about our retailers, and, and that's the type of relationships we want to have. I, I agree, I agree. Barry, do you have anything else along these lines? Um, well, just kind of to touch a little bit more on the on the future uh, of Casa Cuevas a little bit here, uh, Gabe, the uh, question, um, in addition to how many accounts you kind of saw at year's end, you kind of took that question for me too as well. Uh, I really like that you guys are taking a concerted effort and everything. Are you, um, are you at all worried about, um, uh, about that kind of that growth getting a little bit too far ahead of you? Are you guys going to ever is, are you guys going to pull back the rain, so to speak, if you kind of get to that, that, that growth where it's it kind of getting a little too much out of hand or the benefit, the benefit that we have as the manufacturer of our brand, is that we can dedicate as big as a team we need to roll our cigars. So that growth, if we see that it's increasing rapidly, we can bump up production as quickly as we need it. So we don't go into those issues of the back orders and things like that. So that's that's a benefit. It, it's, it's a benefit that not too many boutique companies have, is having their own factory. What about uh, the other cigar companies that uh, that you guys do production for? Uh, how uh, how how did they feel? Or how excited were they about uh, being associated with uh, with this new brand uh, for the guys who've been making their cigars all along? Where, did you get a lot of support from them? We have, honestly, we have um, the sales team for those companies, the ownership. You know, they they've extended their hands and anything that they could help, they've offered it to us. You know, whatever you need, you know, if I can help you in any way, they, they've extended their hands, and we're very appreciative. of it. How about, uh, I know you're focused on the U.S. market, yeah. but is Luis looking possibly at Europe and other markets? Yeah, we are looking at it. We are. We're, we're, we're debating right now whether to go to Inter Tobacco this year, um, but we want to have already relationships in place with distributors over there That's before, we, yeah. you know, be, before we go there blindly. We want to have meetings set up and things like that. If we're going to venture into, into that expense because it's not cheap to get out there, um, we want to be able to have those meetings set in place. So yeah, definitely, we, we're looking for growth. I mean, we have the factory. You know, the, the, the sky's the limit for us, honestly. Do you have a lot of relationships uh, already in Europe, Gabe, or will you be uh, depending on the network of uh, of your salespeople to kind of help uh, facilitate that move if you guys decide that it's good for y'all? Well, in Europe, it's it's Europe is a completely different now. The rest of the world is a completely different animal than what the United States is. You know, here in the United States, we handle our own distribution. We have our distribution office set up here in Miami. We have our own salespeople, whether they're brokers or they're in-house. In Europe, it's different. Each country has their own distributor, and that distributor has their own sales rooms. So it's definitely going to go into play where those relationships with those distributors are going to, you know, control how, how we grow outside of the U.S. And from what I understand about inner tobacco, and I'm I'm learning more about inner tobacco. I haven't been there, but it's that's very much a distributor run trade show from what yeah. I understand. Yeah, yeah. The distributors yeah. set up the booths yep. and then the manufacturers show up and support their distributors. Yeah, which is a lot of times here. Yeah, a lot of times that the, the manufacturers actually have to jump or they have to have multiple people out there to represent, you know, the different distributors for the different countries. Yeah, that was that was definitely my understanding of, of that as well. Um, which, like I said, it was kind of a. I haven't been there. I'm not going this year. I'm, I'm looking at 2018 possibly going. But uh, IPCBR is still keeping me pretty busy right now, which is, I guess, right. a good thing, so to speak. No, no, yeah, you're you're growing faster than than a bad weed, dude. <laughs> Thanks. 
<laughs> yeah, it's been an interesting year uh, with Cigar Coop. So just, I've been very, very fortunate. Things have fallen into place this year. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, it's all good. Then. I'm, I'm proud of you, man. You're doing good things. You're doing them right. You're getting your name out there. People, everybody knows who you are. Yeah, you I've know, been very lucky. I've been very lucky. And I got guys you put like your Aaron, time. Aaron who have been. You really put your dumb. time into this. Thanks. You put your time. You're truly passionate about it. And, and it's not a business for you. No, I, I mean, mean that's, the, that's the way I look at it. It's a business, but it's not. Um, there is, it's interesting because I've had it this year with Split and Cigar Coop off. I had to pay much more attention to certain business things that now were under my control. And I actually had to bring in some folks to help me with that. But um, the good news is um, we're launched so and we're able to do these shows. I got guys like Bear and Aaron, um, and we just want to do something a little different here. So... Um, Knock on wood. Hopefully, uh, I, I, I'm I, my goal is like FDA. We're going forward, <laughs> so there's going to be this brand no matter what. Right. Yeah. I mean, you've always been. Actually, yeah, and I I appreciate the support from like like I said that first day we met in Chattanooga, which I can't believe it's going to be four years in August. Um, mm-hmm. it just seems like it was yesterday, so to speak. Right. Yeah, and then I remember that first interview we did, and uh, Seth was on with us that night, and. Yeah, you just telling us about yeah. Coot, we really had an eye opener with Coots that night in terms of some of the things you guys were doing there. So that was great. Now, now personally speaking, Gabriel, you know, I kind of always like to ask a little bit of questions personal. Um, I see you're a boating guy. Is you're into boating, yeah. which I didn't realize until maybe the last few months. What's uh, what's your passion around boating? Fishing. Fishing. But yeah, you're into I the boats fishing. themselves. Are, you do stuff with the boats themselves, or is it just strictly fishing? Well, I'm rebuilding a boat. That's what I saw, yeah. And that's been a project that's been going on. My wife laughs. And every time I get going on it, something happens in my life that I have to stop. You know, and, and it's it's a passion. It's a headache. But the day that it's done, you know, it's going to be probably the happiest day of my life. Other than having my kids and, and everything else. But... It's been, it's, it's a labor of love, honestly. And, and it's at the point right now that I really can't do much to it because it's going to take a lot of money. And um, my wife's building up her business. So we're focusing on that first. And then, then we'll have time to play after. But uh, we yeah, got to get her. her hands full. She's had her hands yeah. full, I, I can imagine. Yeah, the yeah baby, I mean, a newborn, I mean, that doesn't take any time off your hands at all. No, no, not at all. Not Gosh. at all. I can't tell you how much free time I've had since my son was born. I mean, it's just been crazy. I just, I'm so bored all the time. Right? Yeah. Right. And, and the sleep. We oh, get so yeah. so much sleep. It's incredible. It's, it's incredible. I've never been this well rested in my life. It's fantastic. Mm-hmm. See, now, <laughs> I, I can only do what I do because my youngest is going to be 17 in October, so... Yeah, rub it in, Coop. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate there's, it. There's a whole other set of problems that get introduced. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and and see, my I have one girl, and she was the oldest, and she's married now. So, so that was a a great day. Don't get me wrong, but uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, but I yeah. So I have. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. There. So I mean, yeah, your family, uh, Gabriel, beautiful family. I know Grace Thank for you. many years as well. Um, I mean, I follow you guys on social media. Uh, you and Ga- you and Grace are like the first the first couple of the cigar business still. In no the- yeah. man, please. No. No, does, so what does Grace like Casa Cuevas cigars? She does. She What's does. What's her favorite one? Um, I want to say it's the Habano. She likes the spice behind it. Yeah, nice. She likes the spice, but she doesn't get to smoke nearly as as often as she. No, used I can. To. I, I so. can imagine that. If she smokes one cigar a month, it's too many. Yep. <laughs> I gotta. I have to. I have to say a little hello to Grace uh, there uh, here, Gabe, because I, I uh, from one of my customers, uh, one of my customers, uh, Roger Burke. Actually, he was uh, he was the biggest fan. Uh, we were all fans, but he was just obsessed over the Hecha Sierra. And he said when I when he, I told him that I was interviewing you tonight, and he was like, "Oh my gosh." You have to tell him. I was like, I mean, it's not going to do any good. He's like, just, do, just for me, just for me. I said, okay. Well, you have to. I have to tell you that if if she comes back into the industry and she starts making Hecha Sierra cigars, you know, you've got a guy who'll order them by the crate over here in Texas. <laughs> so 
if she wants to make that move, just let her, just let her, uh, just let her know. She's got a, she's got a huge fan over here uh, in all of us, but him in particular. So he'd be, I uh, think she might be listening. That. So yeah, I saw her in the <laughs> chat room, but that, no, baby, I what, well, myself and my, my former, uh, co-host Paul Asadorian were big fans of the Etchy Sarah's as well. Oh, that was a phenomenal cigar. It yeah, was but, great cigars, yeah. Yeah, but my guy Roger, man, he just, he, yeah. he, it was awesome, man. He, he would just, he loved that stick. He loved it. Yeah, she did a wonderful job with that brand in a short time. And yes, again, absolutely, she, absolutely. As uh, could be, she'd be very proud of that. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Very proud of her. Absolutely, she did a wonderful job. person. A wonderful person. Uh, Barry, you have anything else? Well, I was just kind of to go back on the subject of the boat. I keep, I feel like I keep taking the conversation back a oh, little bit. But I just, I was just wondering. I was just kind of wondering, are you, are, are you kind of like Gibbs from NCIS? Are you, are you building it in the basement of your house there, and you know, chiseling at one piece of wood at a time? There's no, there's no basement here. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's, it's in my backyard, and it's there, and little by little, you know, it, it'll get done, and you guys will see it. <laughs> I put every, every little step on, on my Instagram. So right. Eventually, it'll get done. Hopefully, next year at some point. Fantastic, man. That's look, forward awesome. to the, look forward to that day for you. Yeah, thank you. That would be a thank great you. launch, yeah. I see, a, yeah. I, see a, I, see a, I see a Casa Cuevas party on that boat. Oh, my God. If I could fit five people on it, that would be a great party. <laughs> it's a little 21-footer, man. It's, it's not that big. <laughs> Definitely have to send a bottle of champagne to Chris and that bad boy once Absolutely. that gets there done. Yeah. Now we're talking. Absolutely. Now we're talking. Of course, I, I am a re, I, I am a I am a part time retailer, uh, so it may not be a, the best bottle of champagne. You have to <laughs> It'll be prosecco. <laughs> yeah, hey, that you know, hey, that stuff is good. My yeah. wife drinks it, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, that's great. That's great. Awesome. So, uh, so what we're gonna do is, um, you know, we're uh, we'll take. We're going to take it into our next segment right now. Um, Will Cooper, Bed to Pussy. We're joined by Gabriel Alvarez here of Casa Cuevas Cigars. And um, we, we, uh, we do it. We, we, I think Bear and I, we've kind of set this up right now. It's special edition where we cover a couple of things, you know. Um, and we can't, Bear, you came up with this topic tonight. So I'm going to let you, introduce, I'm going to put you on the spot, but let you introduce it. Um. Yeah, so we kind of talked a little bit about this, and it's it's interesting having uh, having Gabe here with us tonight too. And and I don't think that uh, Cuevas is is on the end of this at all, actually. But it'll be interesting to get someone who is introducing something new, yeah. whether it's brand spanking new or just new to the market in general. And then that's the subject of hype. Uh, you know, I mean, we've 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 been in this industry for a while. Um, you know, every you know, and we've all we've all seen it, guys. We've seen you know the the scars that kind of just get you know, hype to unbelief. And then, you know, when they actually hit the industry or excuse me, hit the marketplace, um, you know, they have a tendency to just kind of fall flat or whatever. And, you know, but there, and then there's some that actually sort of expectation. And, and two of the examples that I gave, and they're two fine, fine cigars. And one of them went one direction. And I feel one took a while to finally build. And it'll be interesting to get Gabe's perspective on this. And I want to get yours on it too, Coop. Is so we had uh, a few years ago when Jericho Hill, Jericho Hill released for Crowned Heads at IPCPR. In fact, it was on. In fact, on it was on your blog, Coop. For uh, you, along with other people, were were just touting this cigar. Is it was that you know it was a, it was a big wide release and it was it was supposed to be the hit of the of the show. I had it as one of the five that and I, you know, and I don't think it did. Yeah, I don't think it disappointed. It actually did. It came into the marketplace. We were really excited about it. I was really because of my first, my second example I'm going to give, which actually preceded the Jericho Hill. I was trying not to get excited about it because I did not want to, I did not want to fall into that, that, that rut with getting into the hype and then it just fall on my face or anything like that. But it really delivered. It was fantastic. It was well balanced. It was, it was great. It was very, it was unique. All the box press sizes. The flavor was there. It was, it was just, and it was fantastic for the market at that time with a medium to full-bodied cigar, uh, with full flavor, uh, that just just hit the the marketplace at the right time, and it hit in stride for that company as well. So, th bravo to them on that. But on the other end, the example that I give was uh, was the Drew Estate Undercrown. The Drew Estate Undercrown to me didn't necessarily like everyone was so excited. I mean, everyone in their everyone in their mom still to this day. 
loves the Liga Pravada number nine. I mean, it's one of the most highly sought after cigars in the world, and it's 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 all about it. And so the Undercrown was supposed to capitalize on the Liga nine market. And for me personally, it took me, and I gave it its due because I smoked through a box of those cigars to finally get myself to say that I actually liked it. Because it, I got through the first two, I didn't like it. I got through third, I liked it a little more. Fourth, fifth, I mean, it was a slow and pa painful, albeit enjoyable, enjoyable, painful process to get to like that cigar. And it's and it's had some sustained success then since then. But I think I'm not I'm not unique to that position. I've got that vibe from a lot of different consumers and a lot of different retailers, frankly, that it kind of did the same thing. It took a while to build. Now it's now it's a staple, you know, in Drew Estate's portfolio and on retailer shelves everywhere. Um, but it definitely did not hit the hype. You know, it did not it did not match the hype. And so, uh, guys, I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to you a little bit. I kind of want to get your opinion on on you know cigars you thought did the same thing and what what can make or break a cigar with hype. You know, I want to just comment. Can I comment first on the Undercrown one? Sure, go for it. I think part of the problem with Undercrown was that at the time, Liga Pravada was it was still a cigar that everyone thought they can get. And it wasn't ever, des I don't think it was ever designed to be like that. So it was, Undercrown had to come in and compete with two very, very epic cigars, the T-52 and the number nine. And it wasn't that it was a bad cigar. No, it wasn't. But it had to, it had to compete with that. And Drew Estate kind of had to, you know, they had to work to kind of, segment Liga Pravada's place in the market, which I think took a while. So as they grew, they had to control the growth of Liga Pravada, but they were able to control the growth and, and build Undercrown a lot more. And I think what for me what hit Undercrown is when they came out with Corona Viva. That's when um I felt that was the cigar that kind of put them over the top with that, where where it was really good. But I did, so I I saw there was a little bit of a of a delay with with that piece. As far as Jericho Hill goes, J John Huber, the guy's a marketing genius. So he has been really, really, um, you know, for the most part, everything he puts out there has turned to gold because he's, he does a very good – without print advertising, he's been able to build momentum uh, through a grassroots effort. What's interesting about the Underground, too, is I think that the sh if – as a model, the, the the shade actually had you know about ten times the success that the Undercrown did when it was released. I mean, it was just it was something that was really highly sought after and and got going very quickly. Whereas the Undercrown had a little bit of a delay, like we were talking about, which was interesting. But it had the Undercrown's already hard work success uh, to to build on, and so it it uh, it wasn't as hyped, but there was a lot of hype behind it, and then it actually had some uh, pretty decent success too. So. And they had, to change, they had to change the marketing a bit on that bear because Undercrown was kind of positioned as this Liga Pravada derivative. Where, hey, you know, we, we're working with these different primings, but we're working with the tobaccos in the Liga Pravada family. And that's how Undercrown, the, the San Andreas one, was, was sold. Now, Kate is a different animal. That was a blend constructed by Willie Herrera. Right. I asked Jonathan about that. And he said point blank, we had to change the messaging of what Undercrown. We had to move away from that model of Undercrown being um, this in, in the Liga Pravada family and kind of make it stand on its own. So it's kind of it's kind of like a spinoff, so to speak, now as a brand. And Undercrown is really, I think, it's like a workhorse brand now of Drew Estate, and they have that yeah. Connecticut market, and they were able to tap into those Connecticut smokers, which they didn't really have anything for a while in that area. So Gabe, I'd be I, Gabe, I'd be interested to get your thoughts on like what you think uh, makes or breaks a cigar with hype or not. Well, without mentioning any names, it's it's when a cigar gets hype, it's it's usually a big company behind it, and it's their next release, and and people are waiting for the next best thing from that company, and if that doesn't deliver or under delivers, that's where that hype falls flat, and that hype, I see it when I had my store, it was usually with advertising and things like that. Because social media and, and it was just getting started back then in, in 11, 2011, 2012. 
I want to say that what's really done a lot for the industry in a positive and in a negative way for cigar brands has been all the, the, the social media groups like on Facebook and things like that where people are connecting all over the nation and now they have personal recommendations and people not actually going out to try and stick because of what somebody else wrote about it. And, and that will kill hype on a cigar immediately because people start reading bad reviews or, or the point systems on the reviews and stuff like that. And then somebody all of a sudden gets an 88 on a cigar in a magazine or an online thread or whatever it is. They're like, oh, 88, that's not a good rating. It's still a great rating when you think about it. I mean, yeah. 88s, 89s, 86s, 87s, in a scale of 100. That's still a hell of a rating on a cigar. Absolutely. Yeah. I've never seen I've never seen a cigar get a hundred, you know, on, on a on a reputable publication or something like that. So that goes to say that the average ratings for cigars are high eighties to very low nineties. Right. We we just got a an eighty eight on cigar snob on our Connecticut. It happened to be that that's the way they felt or their panel felt about the cigar, but somebody else smokes it in, in their book it's a ninety nine or a ninety five. But people are, are, I see it as, you know, the social media and online uh, way of things nowadays, it's double-edged sword for any type of brand, whether it's cigar-related or not. And, it, and it'll kill hype or build hype incredibly fast and throughout the world because people are so connected nowadays that it's no longer print publications only. And in our industry, we can't advertise on radio or TV and, and billboards or anything like that, like it used to be. So those those hypes are now being created by the consumers directly almost. You know, it's an interesting point that he brings up about the say, the system and, you know, how an 87, um, you know, is, is, is a, or an 88 rather is actually a very good rating. Because, I mean, if you look at, if you actually look at the table and like Cigar Aficionado, for an example, you know, they have, they have like 95 to 100 is perfect. That's what they call a perfect cigar. 95 to 100 is perfect. And then 90 to a 95 is, you know, amazing or incredible. Still a great compliment. And then 80 to 90 is still, you know, su a superior cigar. I mean, it still has an, an immaculate description to it. You know, and they, I mean, I've never seen a cigar at Cigar Fish and get below an 80. I don't think I've ever seen one get one below, below an 83 for, for that matter. Uh, but they actually still tell you what a you know what a seventy to an eighty is, and like they even say that you know zero to something is unsmokable. They they have it labeled as that, and so but no one really pays attention to that. They just see that okay, there's cigars that are above it at you know ninety five, ninety four, ninety two, ninety. Eighty eight is kind of the middle of the so called pack in the in the, the grouping that they have, and so they think it's like a, uh, it's an average cigar, and that's not necessarily the case. It's a tremendous cigar but for that particular person or that particular panel well it was you know it just happened to fall fall in with that scoring so it's it's uh, it, that's i think that's a very interesting uh, point that gabe brought up yeah i think you know it, it has become you know it's kind of because we equate it to you know obviously we equate it to grades or whatever you know, what I use, I have the two scoring systems. I have the numerical, which is a merit score, and then I have the the old Stogie Geeks rating, which I still use, which is a, a buying score. And, you know, a fiver is, like, right in the middle of that buying scale. And we're telling people, buy five of those cigars. That's not a bad rating. That's saying, hey, we're still telling you to invest and put five of those in your humidor. You know, that, that's that's not, that's a testament is, is what we look at. But not every score, you know, not every cigar could be a 95. You know, Steve Saka said it. You know, if you if you uh, like every cigar, you're not going to love any cigar. No, and, definitely. And, yeah. So you, you have to kind of draw 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 a line there. You know, you talk to Gabriel. You, you know, you talked a lot about. I know we're getting a little bit into scoring, but I'm a I'm I tend to be pretty patient with getting a review out. I, I'm not the one to kind of. I'm never the first one. If it happens, it's rare. Um, cause I kind of go, there's processes that I follow. I mean, and I, I, everything, everything goes in my, that this one humidor that I have for review. So it's always the same conditions and it's always in there for, you know, a minimum of two to three weeks. Um, and that's just kind of put it on an equal playing field, so to speak. So, 
uh, it's not an exact science, but, uh, you know, I, I kind of said to someone, if you review a cigar like off the truck um, and you give it an 85 and you give it a, or you give it a 95, you, you're really not doing it justice because, I mean, I, I don't know how it is, but you get broadleaf cigars in, in North Carolina this time of the year. It just sucks, sucks the moisture up. So we can't, I can't review them. They just, they just don't smoke. I have to, I have to get them under optimum temperature and humidity. So I usually, and because again, the worst thing I could do is say, "Hey, this cigar don't draw." I think that's the worst thing you could say to a cigar, or in a yeah. cigar review. And that's something you don't want to. Say. And and look, all these factories, you know, the factories, they're all, I've been to enough of them. They're all doing good process, like you said, it, Gabriel. Factories, factories, they're still doing all quality control things. They may be doing best practices differently, but they're still committed to that quality in the end. Which is why, you know, hey, you know what? That's why we don't get a lot of 60s. Because these aren't the type of factories we're dealing with. These are factories committed to building quality products. Well, right now is the best time in this industry for the smoker. There's so many damn good cigars out there. It's, there is. It's, it, and it, yeah. every company that's coming out with cigar, they're trying to just better themselves other than bettering somebody else. It's just, what are we going to come out with next? And, and now... Again, to the FDA issue, we all have our hands tied. We're all handcuffed at the moment. You know, it's it's no longer. And we've seen it at a fa- at our factory, being that we were dedicated strictly to private label for so long. We haven't seen a new customer this year. We are our own new customer this year. But it's no longer that guy that that has a brilliant idea or has an idea in his head of of what blend they're gonna make or or an expansion of a line or, or anything like that, or what's next for them in the horizon. It's, it's gone. It's yeah. gone. That's that this side of the business is frozen. We'd like to say that too. Um, you know, uh, you know, then again, there's a lot of information still trickling out. There's still gonna be a lot of product shown at the IPCVR. I just worry that someone, and I don't have any companies in my head but I'm just I'm concerned that certain companies aren't following the rules. Well, and when, when you see wanted. it, when you see it on social media, and you see all these like small companies and stuff like that try to come out with new blends or factory changes and stuff like that, and they're going to come out with something new. How? Yeah. How? I mean, we retained a, an attorney immediately. Immediately, and, and and our attorney is Frank Herrera, and more versed in this law. Then the man that's filing suit against the FDA directly, it doesn't exist in this industry, you know, and and how smaller companies are are, are trying to come out with new things that weren't there last year. It's beyond me because why it's you're looking for trouble. Sure. You know, and and I'm definitely not going to mention any names, but they're out there. They're you out just there. It on social media, and, and you see, what, what the hell's he doing? Or, yep. or you know, what are they doing? It, it's you wonder, you know, how can they get, how could they do this? And and we're trying to play everything by the book. I mean, we're not releasing anything new that we haven't released ever. I mean, we have another line that we're releasing next year, but that's a grandfathered line. That's something that we're not going to release till we have that predicate certificate or the approval from the FDA in our hands. You know, and, and it's a family line that they that the family came out with, you know, in that predicate date time. It was in the market in that predicate date time. But things that they're asking for to be able to approve this predicate date or, or the, predicate, the product as a predicate product, they're asking us for invoices from retailers, the yeah. invoices that we issued to retailers back in that date frame. Who in corporate America holds things that long? The only reason we would hold them was for the IRS, yeah. and the IRS's rule is seven years. We're past that with the dates that they're asking for with the predicate. And, and that's why I think it, it's going to be really interesting if the lawsuit happens. And I've kind of no, the lawsuit's happening. What's going to happen at whether, the end whether, of the day whether, is the difference. Yeah, you know, well, I, I, I'm which still way wondering, is it going to go? Yeah, I still wonder if it's going to get settled out of court, and that's where you I'm know because. As a company, we're doing everything 
by the book. Our product registrations are in with the attorneys already. We had to submit pictures of every single type of packaging that we did. Bundles, boxes, quantities. You know, we haven't sat down to put blend information yet because we're not there at the time frame that the, the dates are scheduled right. to do it. But once that happens and it's on paper, there's the FDA doesn't understand that crops change. You have to tweak a blend. Year in, year out. Any company does this. Every single company does this. They don't make the same exact cigar year in, year out. They have the FDA to doesn't understand everything. Yeah. Anything. They I don't didn't. think they understand anything. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and in our industry, it's like the wine industry. Wines aren't the same year after. That's why they have dates on bottles. They have year, you know, the year of production on the bottle. Because the following year, they had to change something. The grapes weren't there. They had to bring it in from somewhere else. God knows. But it's the same thing. We have to, you know, we had a bad crop one year of one certain tobacco that we use in our blends. Now we got to go get it from a different supplier. Or one of our suppliers doesn't have it. We have to get it from a different supplier. It came from a different farm. What's going to happen? Nope, that's a fair point. That's a well, it demonstrates their their ignorance was fully demonstrated when they 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 launched you know when they announced and released the FDA deeming regulations, and they lumped us with the vaping industry. That just yeah. clearly demonstrated their ignorance as far as they they have no absolutely zero understanding of premium cigars and tobacco in general. They have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, and it's 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 sad. It really is. Uh, exactly. they've, they've just hand, they've in. handcuffed they've handcuffed brilliant men like and and families like the Cuevas family. They've just they've absolutely handcuffed you guys, and it's just it's just awful. I'm gonna I'm gonna steer this back to the hype discussion a little, because um, <laughs> uh, I want to get my stuff in. But uh, so I had bear. I have two as well. Um, one that I think was hyped and it kind of took off, and then one that I think is in that slower phase right now, and I'm not ready to kind of say it's success or fail yet. So um, I go back to the Camacho relaunch of 2013, when Davidoff re revamped, completely kind of changed the Camacho portfolio in terms of looks. They changed some of the blends. They streamlined the portfolio. They came up with the bold standard. And, you know, anytime you rebrand something, it's a risk. And you know, Camacho was an iconic line for many, many years. When Davidoff got it, it I think Davidoff needed to figure out what they wanted to do with it. I, I don't think they knew what they wanted to do with it right away. So I think they took a couple of years. And then they, they do this relaunch, and Camacho was back. I mean, it, it, it was back, and that's, you know, it's a successful, they put some heavy marketing behind it, they have some good blends. Some of the blends that, and it, I've noticed with Camacho, if the blend hasn't moved, they've eliminated it very quickly, you know, and they kind of worked with the stuff that's been working right now. So, you know, I know when they relaunched the diploma, that one really didn't take off. They kind of eliminated the diploma from the portfolio, but obviously they built it around the Corojo, the uh, Criollo, the, you know, the Camacho Ecuador then came out. So I think, I think from that standpoint, Camacho, big win. Uh, you know, it's always a big risk doing what they did. That could have not worked very easy but uh especially when you make the packaging as different as it was um the other one is you know there was a lot of hype two years ago around padron de Maso, um the connecticut i think that one's been a slower process to to kind of penetrate the i don't i actually talked to george padron on this topic and so i don't want to put i hope I'm, I'm capturing this accurately and i think he even felt it was going to be a longer that he wasn't going to just dump this Connecticut into the market and everyone was going to go to it. Uh, you know, it was something very different what they were doing. And that's, that's I think, been a slower process right now. And they're competing with a lot of other high-end cigars that are Connecticut, a.k.a. Davidoff. So I think the jury's still out on that one right now. I, I don't know. I think we'll know in the next couple of years of how successful that's going to be. Right. Well, it's just completely different than it's just completely different than what every, everything else that they did. Yeah, uh, I mean, what they were known for, what they're famous for, and everything. And and when I even said it, I mean, when I saw that, I was like, okay, something, okay. Uh, 
kind of like if it's you know if it's not broke why fix it you know one of those things uh i mean i understand taking on the challenge i mean you know like i said i uh, i'm a you know i i can applaud and i'm all about risk and uh, you know i think that it's it's phenomenal when a, con- a company can do it you know i you know we there's risks all around this business you know we we, we talked about, uh, you know, Gabe's uh, moves in the industry earlier uh, in this uh, in this broadcast and everything. You know, there's there's risk with anything you do in this business, and uh, for for Padron to actually um, completely just go, you know, ninety degree different direction of what they've been doing and what they've been successful at, turning out number one rankings like it's their job, and just dump a Connecticut on the market. I, I I'm glad that they. Uh, Again, I hope, like you said, you're hoping not putting words in his mouth, but I'm glad he had a real realistic expectation for it, uh, because yeah, I think it has been a slow going for sure. Yeah, yeah, it, um, you know, but at the same time, you can't blame them. They didn't. There was a part of the market that they didn't have. A oh, absolutely. So you know, they they came out, you know, and they came out with, you know, they they came out with a couple of new offshoots of it last year. Uh, I could, you know, we, we've talked a lot about aging, and I can also say, I think if you age some of those Damasos, smoke them with some age on it, you see some big differences with that cigar, too. So, you know, and Padron doesn't have a sales force either, so they kind of are doing this on Padron's reputation. So, you know, they don't have someone in the store saying, hey, this is what the cigar is all about, here's the story. They've kind of had to do it how they've always done it with their other lines. Which makes it more tough, you know. I think they've, I think they've hit some challenges with that. Yeah, and just to just to comment on your thing about Padron, I think uh, I I completely agree with you there, Coop. I think that was uh, a huge risk for them to kind of rebrand a very you know very iconic brand that was in existence. You know, when they took over ownership of it, there were a lot of questions. Uh, what what Davidoff? Was going to do with this brand because it was kind of an edgier brand to begin with already, and then they they took it up and ran with that even with their their rebranding of it and and really turned it into a complete, you know, a complete polar opposite of what they do and what they're completely successful at. So you know, on one hand, we're talking about Padron doing that and it being slow, and then we're talking we're you know we're praising Davidoff saying, well, they you know they hit the nail on the head with this one, but I think. Um, they also don't have Davidoff's name on Camacho either, so I think no. that I think that kind of helped as well. No, yeah, you know what's surprising though? What surprised me about that one was there was this there was this lull with Camacho for about three years, where Camacho was just there was nothing new coming out of Camacho. It really was it was starting to have a reduced footprint in his stores. Uh, I've seen a lot of stuff on closeout, um, so you know. There was, you know, come, you know, other brands were starting to get a footprint in the market, um, you know, and then even Christian by that point had already launched CLE, so you know they were a little behind. But they, what they did is they went to their strengths. They went to the Corojo leaf, which was really the whole, a big strength of come out, and they built the brand around the Corojo, is what they did. So I, I think it's a, I think it's a really that's a really it's probably the most at that level i haven't seen a relaunch as successful in the cigar i can't think of another one i'm talking about at that scale you know that's probably the one i look at that was you could say whether you like the cigar or not that's an argument we could we can make but people are buying come on i've been to the davidoff uh i've been to enough of the davidoff uh dinners and stuff at ipc you know that's one of their that's a performing brand they did no. If it wasn't performing, uh, they you know, like Zeno wasn't something performing for Davidoff, and that's why it's kind of falling off. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Uh, not on this particular subject, Coop. But I know that uh, there was there was a. Uh, a couple things that uh, you wanted to talk about here at the end of the broadcast, uh, but I, I would like to mention on a on a on a personal note. Um, this uh, this past weekend was uh, was really hard was really very hard in the Michael's Tobacco uh, arena. Uh, we lost one of our uh, most popular and and 
most popular consumers, one of our customers, uh, he was he was family. He was more than friend. He was a family, and uh, um, he was known as a uh, as Super Dave, Dave Larson. Uh, very suddenly, um, on Friday evening, uh, had a stroke, um, and uh, and he was hanging out with one of uh, one of his friends from our shop as well. Actually, at another at another uh, another cigar shop location, and uh, uh, it was very sudden, came out of nowhere. And this was a guy who, you know, uh, was always on the golf course, was always on a bike, you know, riding trails, uh, you know, up until just a, you know, a few months ago, uh, you know, uh, definitely epitomized a very healthy living. I mean, only, only a very young 61 years old and, uh, and, uh, very suddenly had a stroke and, uh, by, uh, by Saturday, you know, by Saturday morning, he was, uh, he was gone. They, you know, he was officially, uh, taken off the ventilator on Sunday and it was, uh, it was very, it was a very hard weekend for, uh, for the Michael's tobacco community. Um, he, uh, he'll definitely be missed. So, uh, so Dave, uh, uh, wherever you are and I hope you're listening. I, I just want to bid you adieu and I hope that, uh, hope that God's got a golf course, uh, paved with gold for you to play on. So we wish you well. I hope you rest in peace, my friend. No, Bear, you know, I've been, um, you know, when we have a local shop and, you know, Gabriel's a shop, you know, you meet people in the, in the shop. You spend a lot of time, you're in the shop day to day and you build friendships, but there's, there's something about the friendships in the confines of that cigar lounge that it, it kind of takes on another dimension. And we had, a. You know, we had a we had a, one of our local guys. This is in 2008, uh, a former Marine. You know, he was he was a former Marine from the Korean War, an elderly man. He he passed away, and I just I know that feeling. I've uh, I've been down. You know, so it, it's it's a it's a loss because you feel it becomes it moves from friendship into that family realm almost. Definitely, most and, definitely. And it, it it hits you harder. You know that maybe I didn't communicate with this guy much outside the cigar lounge but there's something it's it's when you're in a lounge you you, sh- you share things you know you share things and your problems or just look for encouragement and stuff so I, I i've been down that road i know i know that's a hard thing for you know we you know our thoughts and prayers are with his family and friends right now for sure. yeah. thank you yeah um and on a, on, a, on another note there was not to be the uh bearer of bad news but i think a lot of folks found out this week uh, bob marino a he's a industry veteran in the cigar business um bob passed away last week a week ago today um for folks who didn't know bob uh bob was a uh, he came he had a successful career at coca-cola in management and then he moved over into the cigar industry yeah he first started off at zycar based in Kansas City where he was from um, Bob did very well on the marketing end of things yeah he moved over to EP Carrillo he became I believe he was their first national sales manager um, he then moved over to La Polina uh, as well and I think he was part of a big part of the growth of La Polina for the sh- he was there and then he moved into Davidoff um, he was working on the DuPont Alliance with them and I believe Bob's position was eliminated at Davidoff late last year <laughs> And so Bob was working outside the industry right now, but um, I have some I have some thoughts on Bob because uh, the, the, the funny story is um, Bob originally thought I was a writer for Half Wheel when he first met me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how it started out. Uh, um, and he came into my he came into my shop in Charlotte, um, and Bob was a road warrior. Bob was oh, Bob wasn't a guy who sat behind a desk and counted numbers. He's like Gabriel, you know, in, in that natural sense. He was out with his customers. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of how we start. But Bob was a guy um, he helped. I, I could pick the phone up and call Bob and say, hey, Bob, what's what's the deal with this? Or what's happening with this? Um, and he always got back to me. He was always responsive, honest and forthright. And uh, we also had another bond in that we both grew up in Staten Island, New York. So um, all I know is that Bob, I believe Bob got sick very quickly. And uh, he passed away, like a lot of people were. were so that hit, that surprised a lot of people. 
um, as well. So I got word of it right before I was going on the radio in Atlanta on Saturday, but I didn't quite have all the details. And, then, you know, you obviously don't want to say someone's dead if they're not dead either. So, um, you know, it, you know just, but, yeah, it was it was very, very unfortunate. So I think it was a big loss. You know, again, did I pick the phone up and call Bob every day to chat? No, but when Bob was in town or Bob, would, you know, we'd get together for smoke, things like that. So, again, kind of that you build that family in the cigar industry. So, uh, again, thoughts and prayers with Bob and Bob's friends and family at this time as well. Absolutely. Yep. So, um, Any brighter subjects? Yeah, we, have, yeah, we got to finish on a positive note there. Um, well, um, I'm putting it up there. <laughs> well, hold on. The, the, the news out of Iowa is something interesting. Yeah, the, yeah the, actually, the, the news yeah. out of Iowa. So we, we had talked earlier about um, – we had talked earlier on a, uh, another show – uh, specifically about uh, some legislation that's being currently introduced uh, in the Texas legislature by uh, Representative Matt Shaheen, uh, House Bill 1279, that would and uh, essentially essentially eliminate all future regulations, restrictions, or laws that could be put forth that would prevent a cigar shop from existing. So. Uh, cigar sh premium cigar shops that uh, sell more than 51% uh, or more of their revenue is streamed from cigars. Uh, they would forever be free from uh, from any restrictions. So they were basically sanctioned as you know sanctuaries uh, for the cigar smoker. And it's a it's a brilliant and very simple piece of legislation that's being proposed right now in the House in Texas. And uh, with that, um, what's really interesting in Iowa is, and I'm trying to get the name of the actual bill here in just a second. Uh, it was actually passed either yesterday or this morning, uh, and it was actually passed with zero nay votes. Now, it was kind of hidden in a law that had to do with uh, a law that had to do with like a minimum wage and some other other some regulations and stuff and laws and everything like that. But basically, and it's uh, Bill HF 295 in Iowa. So basically, there will be no grandfathered restrictions allowed on any tobacco, including pre premium cigars. Uh, going forward, so like, uh, so ex for example, like if a county wanted to introduce a new tax on uh, premium cigars, um, they uh, they couldn't do it. You know, minimum age increases will not happen in Iowa. Uh, so everything is now, you know, if it's I think it's still 18 there in Iowa, or in the if any of cities or counties or municipalities have increased it to 21 now, they can uh, no longer change it. So. Uh, no other city can go up to 21. Uh, no other counties can go up to 21, and uh, no other restrictions can be put in place. So, and it passed with is, again zero nay votes. So obviously, even if it you know even if this was hidden in some kind of other piece of legislation that had to do with other stuff that had a lot more I guess more positives than than I guess if they wanted to consider this a negative uh, for guys who might have you know for politicians who might have been on the fence about this issue. It obviously wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to dissuade them from voting yay in this scenario. So this was actually, a, in my opinion, so far what I've been able to do some research on is a huge win for our industry, and it can be done. Yeah, uh, it can be done in Texas. So I, I, you know, I hope that House Bill 1279 gets pushed through, and I hope that uh, other states as well kind of follow suit. That you know, you know, with uh, with our industry, that you know, you know, we can have our little slice of heaven. It's 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 certainly possible. Uh, and it's certainly doable, and it's not going to do any harm to to anybody else. And uh, it will be a huge win for us if we can get House Bill House Bill 1279 uh, pushed through, uh, and then any other states who follow suit uh, to do the same thing. You know, we we our retailers need to stay in existence, man, because without retailers, Gabe's there looking for another job, and you know, Coop's looking for another job, and you know, it's it it all it all starts, you know. People it all starts stuff from the ground up. can't do what we're doing here. Exactly. Absolutely. So let me ask a question. What's the advantage of doing it? What, what would be an advantage? Why put in a legislation like, I mean, I'm thinking for a second. All right. They're not looking after the tobacco industry. No. And, and again, I don't think the, I don't think the Iowa law that was passed was actually even, that wasn't even on the forefront. House Bill 1279, very, very much so. Again, it's a very simple piece of legislation that, uh, Representative Shaheen is pro proposing, and it has completely and 100% to do 
with the premium tobacco industry and the premium cigar industry. So it's not, it's not hidden or anything like that. And this piece of legislation for Iowa, there's a very, it's a very cornered part of the bill. And again, there's a lot of other, a lot of other working parts inside of it. And I think that's why it was able to pass through. Whereas where 1279, I think, there, there will be a lot of pushback on it because it is very specific. They're not hiding it. They're putting it at the forefront like, hey, we want cigar shops to exist and we don't want anyone to, to mess with that. So it will be a challenge, but yeah, it would be great. It will be a challenge, and but maybe we can follow, you know, maybe the state of Texas can follow suit with that and kind of piggyback onto some other piece of legislation and hide it, so to speak, so that we can, so that we can keep something like this, uh, keep something like this going. Because it's, it's, it's a very very wonderful wonderful law obviously and it's a it's a wonderful simple law that's that would just really help out small business in general and keep a lot of people uh keep a lot of people working agreed agreed so that's For that, sure. is, that is some good news uh the, the big fear sometimes with those when it's wrapped up and we'll talk the we're going to talk the glenn loop on this i'll talk about that in a second but um sometimes when these things are wrapped up with other things though that, not to be the negative guy, but sometimes that's the stuff that gets negotiated out. Now, this has to go to. Does this have to go to a Senate vote in Iowa? No, it's done. It's it's passed in the law. It, so the governor signed it into law. Yes, the governor signed it. So according. this is it. So the only way they could change it is with another piece of legislation. Correct. Right? Which Correct. is, as we learned, it's very hard to undo a piece of legislation. Yeah, yeah according to yeah, according to my resource, it's. Uh, yeah, it's, it was signed into law either, again, it was either late last night or, or this morning, and the governor has signed it. Oh, that's great. That's great news. Awesome. That's great news. Maybe other states, like I said, will follow suit. Um, and I, and I kind of just mentioned this as well. So um, we have a special edition scheduled for June 27th. We may have another one in between. Um, but June 27th, we have Glenn Loop on. Uh, it's going to be a full... It's going to be a full cigar rights um, special edition. And Bear and I are really going to, um, it's going to be a really, you know, this is going to be one you're going to want to hear. I mean, we've heard Glenn on a lot of shows, but I think we have some interesting topics, so to speak, um, where we're going to really kind of, you know, from an industry perspective, really get into this. So I think if you're, you know, you, you know, if you've probably heard a lot of this stuff before, but, you know, we're going to try to really give give a perspective and, and, and get Glenn's, Glenn's perspective on that as well. So uh, you'll definitely want to tune in for that on um, June 27th. And, you know, there may be some things happen, you know, the way things are, who knows what's going to happen between now and then. Um, every time I, in, I haven't interviewed Glenn in about 15 months. So I, I haven't interviewed him uh, since the regulations went into effect because when we had him on Stogie Geeks, I was in Cuba that week. So I didn't get a chance to interview him. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, this Thursday, we have uh, a gentleman by the name of Brian Moussard from a company called Cattle Baron Cigars. I've interviewed this gentleman before. He's a great interview. His cigars are really good. Uh, he's also uh, part of the cattle industry, this guy. So uh, we'll be talking a lot about steak that night. And uh, he also makes vodka. So uh, you'll want to tune in for it that. just sounds awful. Steak, vodka, yeah. cigars. My goodness. Cigars. Good and Lord. then the following week on uh, – Prime time. Actually, that was prime time for Thursday. Is we're gonna have Brian Musad. Um, for prime time on the twenty uh, second, we're gonna have Claudio Sarai of um, Mombacho, the master blender for them and president of the company. So, a uh, lot to look forward to over the next few weeks uh, as we get into IPCPR. So, uh, want to thank Gabriel very, very much. Uh, yes, as thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, guys. Yep. Um, and um, with that, we will wrap up um, num special edition number three. Uh, thanks to everybody for tuning in, and uh, we'll see everyone on Thursday night on the primetime show. Take care. See you next time, everybody.